so uh, I guess we have half an hour. Um, what I got asked to talk about here was <coughs> uh, my experience with the and actually building the community um, uh, around that over the last couple of months. So uh, I'm not going to repeat what Scott helped me explain to you earlier in terms of how DeepRacer works and mechanics, and we can go into questions over lunch if you want to know some of the tips and things. But it's more about <coughs> the, the ecosystem around engaging people through that process. Before we dive into the material, a bit, a bit, a bit about me. Um, I think I've probably spoken to most of you already, but so my background is in architecture, tend to be more enterprise solution architecture. Uh, I'm a work on a freelance basis at the moment, and so I've also been running a startup um, of various success a lot. Um, but the deep racing thing is a complete hobby, so that's a kind of complete side thing um, out of this. But interestingly, I've learned loads from bits about reinforcement learning. Now I'm trying to think about how I can actually fold that back into the consultancy work that I do. So this session is um, yeah how I built this the AWS Deep Racer community, um, and yeah that was the blurb that uh, Karen gave me helpfully. Um, so hopefully that's what you want to hear. And um, now I like this picture. This this for me kind of reinforces some of the things that um, uh, Scott was talking about earlier in terms of with reinforcement learning you, you, you set a rule, you set an idea of what you think is right, um, and, and Racer is like an insolent child who will adhere to your rules but find a way around it. So in this case, the child's not allowed the iPad in the kitchen, but he's not allowed food in the lounge. And so the solution, right? And that's exactly what the car does. It will always find another way around it in the process. Um, and you have to get one step ahead of that each time. So what we're going to talk about is um, a bit of the history as to uh, how I got to this point and, um, and then where the community is, what it's achieved how I got there, and then a little bit around logistics. Um, the last section will be interesting in terms of why it hasn't been successful, um, and I'd be interested to have a bit of a chat on that if we have time in terms of how repeatable is what I've done on this community for other other technologies and topics around AWS, and uh, heads up, I don't think it will, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so, once upon a time, I land far, far away at the AWS London Summit. Um, like, I guess many of you guys, as we racing on the track, um, and that was my first taster of the racer in the flesh. Um, I actually got access to the console about three days before that, so I had a slight advantage in that I trained the model for about six hours before going. Most guys who, who were there were training on the day or using one of the default models. And, uh, you know, a little tip, you don't get around very fast with a default model off the back of it. But it was great fun. Um, and I think I got about three cycles around. And after one of those cycles, I managed to get top of the leaderboard, um, which was kind of fun. Uh, and that lasted about a whole 60 seconds before uh, <laughs> I got knocked off. But the back of it, if you haven't seen, is that actually uh, a a Amazon are building and um, recording a documentary about Deep Racer. Uh, and it's available on Amazon Prime. Um, I haven't got my IMDb reference yet, but if you go and get the episode of London, you can see essentially me and everyone else on a day. Uh, and so, yeah, there's YouTube videos of us. Um, and I should stop at this point, actually, if you watch the video, you'll see for some reason they decided I was the only person in the video to put subtitles on, so. <laughs> <laughs> you can't understand <laughs> Put your hand up, right? A lot of my job is standing up in front of people talking, so it was always offensive, that was what <laughs> Anyways, at the end of the day, I came fifth, um, which I was pretty pleased about, and it means that I won one of the cars, eventually, when we get to um, all top 10 winners at any of the races, any of the summits, win one of the cars. Yeah, delivery date, two weeks confirmed. But out of that chat was, um, I got talking to pretty much all the people on this list, um, and there was a great sort of camaraderie discussion. Um, as I say, you know, I, I pushed it forwards and then someone knocked me off and things like that. And I thought, this is a great chat. I don't want to lose this chat. I want to carry on with this chat. Um, and so I took all the email addresses, all the LinkedIn details, uh, and afterwards I, I set up a Slack community. And I was like, hey guys, let's just carry on chatting. Um, why did I choose Slack? No reason particularly. It just happened to be one I was using for some of my projects. As we'll say later on, in hindsight, it may not be the best choice, but it was a really simple way to get people together to have a chat. And my goal really was, let's just carry on that conversation. And, and as a London community initially. But what I found pretty quickly though was um, it, it, it grew and more people were interested, and, and particularly on the forums on, on the Amazon website, is um, people had questions. There wasn't a lot of feedback from Amazon, and so there was a need, and so it was like, let's just drop the London aspect of the community. So it's just an AWS suddenly then you'll see, actually now we've got over 500 members, um, and that's like in what, three and a half months since it became generally available. Um, 
unfortunately there's uh, probably 4,000 messages in there, uh, and we're on three tiers, so only the last 10,000 are actually accessible, which is a pain to come back to. But we have people now over the world um, taking part in the community, and that's really great, it's really vibrant, and there's a lot of different ideas as a result of that, and so whilst we started the little London community, that's, that's long gone. And one of the key stats I really like is actually, as a community, we've got 24 top 10 winners um, and, and many of them first place winners. Now there's also a question, obviously, correlation. So are people who win like to come to the community or do the community create winners? And we have actually genuinely got some community created winners. The Stockholm winner um, came to our community about three days before, brand new to this, what have I got to do to race fast? And we helped him, and he, and he won, uh, which was good fun. So, um, it's evolved though. So initially we were just having a chat, um, racing tips, um, but very quickly people realised, um, damn, this thing's expensive. <laughs> and so actually in the community, some of the guys started engineering about how we can take the whole stack and helpfully we found out how to download it through Rebelmaker, um, reverse engineering the code. And there's a guy in Australia who um, has, has ported uh, S3 to Minio and has gone through the source code and, and has made it so it can run on local saves a bunch of money. Um, so in the ethos of Amazon are keen for people to learn and not sell tin. Um, there's been a, an open discussion and, and some, you know, acceptance of this fact, but it means that actually most people are affording to trade and to race in here, which otherwise could have been done. So and um, that's a key takeaway. But there's also other things that the community have done. Um, we've enhanced the log analysis tooling, um, and we've built some Visualization tool, as I mentioned earlier, we can see actually where the car is looking at on the track. And this is just from people in the community who have gone, this is great fun, how can I push it to the next level? And um, how can I build a repo? And how can I build a blog post explaining some of these things and share it back? Partly to help themselves do better in the racing, but also to that sort of cycle. And this is one of the key things we've kind of tried to instill in our community is um, it's not just about helping newbies get up and running, it's about helping newbies get up and running to help the next generation of newbies and actually have a continual sort of growth of people as they mature or prove that so that I haven't got to be sat there responding to every single message and question that comes up in it. And at the moment I just watch to see what isn't getting answered and then I, I might drop into the chat. But most things now, someone else, even as recently as last week, will be joined will be answering those questions. Um, and then Alex The correct is only on Slack. At the moment it's only on Slack. So yes, yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna and, get uh, it. Uh, I'll probably come more after it is locked already. Because you didn't pay for the five dollars for Slack. It's not five dollars. It's five dollars per person. Per person. Uh, per, per, per month. Um, and so that's the problem: is that this thing doesn't scale very well. Because it's an enterprise tool. And anyways, so one of the things and we're Amazon are not willing to. Uh, <laughs> 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 but we've had some chats. Eh? <laughs> but no, the short answer is: uh, what is the cost-benefit ratio on there? And actually, what we are actually seeing is that a lot of the conversations have to repeat itself. Um, and that's not necessarily an efficient way of answering those common questions. So what we're trying to do is capture the knowledge that people keep asking us and build a knowledge website base, which is not quite live yet, but it is, is in the works. And there's a way to get uh, the old data? Yeah, so, so we, we've got, as I say, a lot of it is cycling. And we have um, got some archives on the point we realized Slack has a download function, um, which unfortunately wasn't there. What I'm hoping eventually is that we'll kick everyone out of the community, so it's just me, and I'll pay five dollars, and I'll get more history, and then <laughs> download it then. Um, uh, yeah, so there's, there's been a whole bunch of things, and it's evolved, and, and you know, there's you know, not necessarily curated. People are actually voluntarily going out, pushing the limits, pushing the bounds, as well as helping new people get up to speed, uh, and that's actually taking the technology on. Um, and so, as I say, there's, there's people over the place. <laughs> this is not a localized thing. It's not in London, but now we've, we've got people all around the world, um, and, and that's growing. Uh, and out the back of that, actually, um, we've actually got a whole bunch of meetups. So people are now meeting in real life as a result of joining on the community. Uh, and in my little journey of holidays over the last six weeks, I've been traveling around, and so I've met people in Dublin, met people in New York, met people in Seattle now, um, and it's great. And even at the conferences and uh, the summits, we've got people who've been meeting up ahead of the conference, at the conference, racing together, uh, and, and it's good fun. So we want to join to a lot more of these meetups, um, because A, it's, it's good for practicing on the real track, um, and that's the biggest limitation is how you find the physical track cars at the moment. Um, but also in terms of actually getting awareness out there. And so in London, earlier in the year, pre-community, um, they ran a, a, a general racer FAQ come along to find out about it and they had 70 people turn up. 
uh, completely you know, without much advertising or anything else. Like that. So there's a lot of appetite for racing, getting on the track, but also just generally finding out about it. So we're trying to balance off both of those things. But as we get closer to reinvent, and, and the people who are going to go there are in the top 48 and going to be racing, there's going to be a strong desire to get on the actual track to practice our models because, as you saw earlier, as great as the virtual environment is, racing on a physical track is quite different. So it's hard to prepare for that. In terms of the women's zone, um, as it stands, this is the top 24. So in terms of who gets to go to um, reinvent as a, as a prize, the, the first place winners do, um, but then the runners up. Um, so on the virtual races, there's 18 runners up spots, and this is the tracker of all the points at the moment. So what you'll see is, um, let's just cut off slightly there, a bunch of people have got the, the trophies on there and already won first place tickets, um, so they don't count, they've already got there. All the ones in red are in the community. Um, so actually, there's only going to be a handful of people who, who are going who actually are part of the community, so it's going to be one big party in Vegas um, <laughs> for, for Deep Racer, which is great. We need to get some sponsorship for some drinks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how do we get there? So as I say, we, we started in May following the London Summit, um, and it was just friendly catch-up communication. Um, we had some of our first community winners in terms of the, the May virtual race, and um, all bunch of us did pretty well on that. that. Um, then it kind of evolved in June, um, where we established contact with AWS. We had a bunch of um, contacts, um, with Cameron and some local people in London, who have been helping us start slowly to get access into the core team, um, which we're building a lot now through, through this event as well. But we also found the first bugs. So on the, on the Deep Racer stack, we found four or five sort of critical issues through June, which we reported uh, and then got fixed in the background and things like that, which um, had some fundamental influence on it got fixed, but all the models we trained up to that point were no longer usable. And so uh, swings around us. Um, then in July, um, we started getting um, more growth. Um, so by the end of June, we had sort of maybe 80 people in the community. Um, and, uh, and that's when EC2 local training sort of, sort of came out. Um, and then in August now, uh, Udacity helpfully um, started their scholarship program, which you can go and Google that yourselves. They're giving away a free scholarship to the top 200 people. Um, but it meant there's like 10,000 people in their group who don't have a lot of support, a lot of cash to just train. And they then um, come over to our platform and to try and get help to run through. So in the future, um, we're going to start building a knowledge base for the website. We're trying to create a place that people want to come to. Um, because yeah, the documentation on the Amazon website is a great start, but it's, it's just not, not enough there. And it's not really <coughs> things like Scott's doing for it. It's going to be the back end of this knowledge base? Yeah, that's, that's one of the questions we're still working on. So we're writing the content, but we haven't quite landed on a, on a tool which quite nails what we want to do yet. So that's why we're not live yet, but we'll, we'll get through it. Until the day 10 minutes, I'm going to carry on. So, great. Um, yeah. Belly in the and that's what you definitely came on the right? So you can see a trend there. But what's more interesting is how do people find out about the community? Um, and this is, I guess, a key question about actually how can people take some of this learning? So I've been quite active in initially seeding um, the community in different places. So um, a lot of people discovered us from the AWS forums um, and not getting much answer there and then coming to us um, and following the links I've posted. Udacity is obviously a big one in there. Um, but even people at the summits have been discovering, sharing the link um, to join, and that's been great. What are people doing in the community? Is it more interesting? I, I really like this one. So, a lot of people, what this is showing is, just kind of cut off slightly, is the purple line and the top one is uh, where people are reading in the public channels and where people are reading messages in private channels. And so, most people are reading the stuff that's being shared, it makes sense for everyone. But where are most people talking? The red line actually shows that private messaging, DMing, is way more popular in the community than public. So people are helping when they have challenges, but there's a lot of back-end chat and, and discussion and almost collaboration and teamwork in small little groups, um, which is which is interesting. Of course, all that conversation, we don't get visibility of unless you happen to be in there. But, it, but it just reinforces the community aspects. Um, so logistics, we mentioned, um, I chose Slack uh, for not a lot of reasons. Um, in hindsight, it was a bad choice because of the history. It's more of an enterprise tool. And so we're thinking about maybe uh, other talking out there, Discord or, or whatever it might be, but because we've now got this established, it's kind of hard to know when's the right point to move across. But from a scaling perspective, it will come to a point where actually we're only going to have a day for the history and um, because we're getting so much throughput and that really makes it a point to talk. So we will have to move off at some point. But we've also made the community much more interactive using some tooling. So 
and we've built a community bot um, that actually tracks all the community members and um, positions of the league. So we've got a mini virtual league in our own environment, but we've also got the tracker of, of who's going to Vegas and, and that updates in real time. Um, we've um, built in some better uh, tooling for, for finding answers um, that are already in there, but, but users aren't really using that all the time. They're still answering a brand new question rather than searching for what's already discussed. And then more recently, we've started building a, a welcome bot to, to help people come in with the, here is your getting started guide. <laughs> so that's the best place for you to start and then come back and have a chat and hear a thing like that. Because at scale, it's just not possible to say hello, although I still try and welcome everyone personally into the group. We'll see. And um, uh, what am I doing in the community is I'm, I'm kind of puppeteering in the background. Um, I'm thinking about how we structure the conversation. So initially in Slack, we started with one channel um, and then very quickly we realized that was getting out of hand and so we each month we're kind of working out what the chat is and then restructuring the, the channels to better align to that. Promoting it um, through various mediums, getting people aware of it, and thinking about where we go next with the community. And that's partly why I'm here and talking to Cameron and other people about how can we actually grow this, what does it mean, how can we help Amazon, how can we help ourselves in the process. Um, but thinking that's the next step ahead so we can keep people engaged because they will get bored eventually. So how can we, how can we prolong this um, and that? Um, make the conversation productive. Um, um, is a key one, so really trying to nurture good quality conversation and not perhaps in the conversation we'll see some screenshots and learn it from the Audacity channel where it's just chaos. Um, uh, so try and work from everyone personally, um, just to build a bit more friendliness in it and openness to, to encourage everyone um, and, and thinking about how actually we can keep people engaged. Um, but it's not easy, um, this is obviously a hobby, um, finding the time, uh, we get a lot of repetitive questions, um, how we keep up the growth and the Audacity is pressured a lot. So I haven't got answers for these problems. These are the problems for you on your own community. What is the pressure you get from that city? So basically, as I said, they have 10,000 people, and these are people who, in a lot of the cases, are coming from geographies where there's not a lot of cash, they're, they're, they're poor, um, and they're seeing this opportunity that Jassy gives them a free scholarship to get themselves a qualification. Uh, and perhaps the advertisers are misleading that the $30 credit you get is enough to qualify, and people very quickly realize they're not. Uh, and so, they then discover that we've got the level of training and guide and things like that, which cost them nothing, and so they're, they're coming across to us. But the pressure is they, they're, they're in a polite way, um, coming to us to leech information and support. Um, and some of those guys are great then at contributing back to that thing. A lot of the guys are then just going off and racing because they want to get the scholarship and not necessarily commit to the community. So it's how we can kind of balance that trade off between having an ecosystem which is supportive and we're all learning as opposed to just running for support for Amazon. Not what we want to do in Canada. So why has it been successful? Um, it's addictive. Um, I, I think it's no surprise it's in Vegas that we're having the finals of these things. It, it, it is a game of skill, but at the end of the day, it, you're betting um, with, with cash in terms of training. Uh, and most people won't win. They'll lose. The house always wins, right? Um, <laughs> but it's different, though, because I can't imagine porting this to, say, you know, you know Document DB or one of the other tools in there. Um, it's the gamification aspect to it, which is really engaging people making them, hey, I'm going to learn, but there's also a chance to win something out the back of it, and I think um, the rest of the products will fall off by the same. And this is the sort of chat we have in our community, you know, so someone's asking about learning rates and, and how that adjusts the conversation, and then a whole bunch of people are coming in, giving them some meaningful insight, maybe giving them some links and ideas and explanations. So this is the knowledge we're trying to capture now and put into a set of better documentation. This is the sort of chat you get in your Dastic channel, where you've got 10,000 people going, What's a car? How big's a car? <laughs> There's no relevance to, to, to the virtual racing, to the actual scholarship in the process there. Uh, and then people say, I'm going to get, how am I going to race? That, that's, that, that, and if, if you don't leave it unchecked, that's how it will evolve into it. Um, you know, that's why I'm trying to think about our communities, how we can have more of this conversation and less of that conversation in the process there. We seem to be working somehow um, in the process. But why did the community like it? I asked the guys in the community why they liked it. And they, you know, these are the things they've been telling us. Um, so in particular, they like the collaborative aspect to it. So on the forums, question and answer, it's not very collaborative. Whereas when we're bouncing ideas back and forth through, through the real-time chat, that's, that's great. We're evolving our collective like, knowledge and our ideas. And then some people are going off and building tooling off the back of it, which is really helpful. But it gives access to people who are both experts, either in terms of they've got like PhDs and masters in, in this sort of stuff, or people who have spent too much time racing and have learned a lot about how to get around the tracks and people are mostly willing to share some of that knowledge um, uh, in the process there.
got, I guess, like, will it scale? Will it port to other products? Um, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see. But I think the key is in the gamification. But more generally, the, the discussion, the collaborative nature that um, kind of evolved the product, I think, is what has made it grow quickly and be successful in the process there. Um, but the nature of the product with DeepRacer is that it's addictive, it's great fun, um, and so people are going to continue to want to do that. That's uh, pretty much my uh, talk. Um, there's some quotes which you can read later on. Um, if you want to join the community, just head over to join.deepracing.io and it will connect to Slack and then you can join in the process there. And eventually, deepracing.io will host the, the knowledge base that we're uh, working on. Any questions? How do you feel about the fact that there's more private messages in public? Do you feel like that's in the spirit of your community? Or? Well, I think because it's not 100% private, um, that yeah, it's the nature of the problem again. People are trying to be competitive. They, they're willing to share it enough, but the, the, there's little niches or in the background, which is, you know, they're still collaborating. It's just a slightly like small group. Um, so it's how, yeah, how we can bring that out into the public. Um, so, you know, we get a lot of questions about, like you said earlier, how can, we, how can I win the race? Like, well, <laughs> you kind of, it's a learning exercise, right? And so we'll, we'll help you along that journey, but if we just tell you the answers. You're not right. really going to learn reinforcement learning in the process there. And so there's, there's always aspects you want to keep back in, in, in that. So, um, but the key is that when people do post public questions, they're getting answered and, and they and they're getting the answer. So I'm yeah, I'm okay with the, the private public nature of it. Did you think about maybe using Reddit? Uh, so there is a Reddit channel for Deep Racer. I don't know who set it up or uh, is moderating it. Um, for some reason, it's not popular. Not popular. Um, there's like ten messages on there or something in, in three months. So. Um, yeah, I, I don't know why what we've done in through Slack or, or the nature of what I've set up is more engaging than what Reddit is. I, yeah, I haven't quite sussed that one out, but for some reason Reddit hasn't been as successful. Any other questions? No? Okay, good. Perfect. Then it's over. Yeah, one minute left for questions. Anyone else have any questions? <laughs> well, I'll put the question. So one of the, I, just a question, maybe yeah. a comment to the, to the community. One of the things that I got a lot of flack about was publishing my reward functions for some reason. Right. And I'm not really sure why that that occurred. Mm -hmm. Because one of the third place people in some place said, yeah, initially I didn't understand why you did that. And I was really pissed off. Mm -hmm. What? It's just silly stuff that I, I came up with. And so that's why I'm kind of, kind of interested in this trade off between preserving the competition aspect but also being open source mm -hmm. about it. You know, where do you see that? Yeah, so uh, I, say, I think it's a fine line in terms of, for me, it's an, it is a learning exercise at the end of the day, but what we're trying to do, what Amazon trying to do, is, is take away the unnecessary learning and, and get to the relevant learning, in this case, reinforcement learning. And so, you know, if you just get the answer in terms of this is the perfect reward function, people, you know, like I say, a lot of the ESC guys, they just want to get scholarship, they don't really care about how they got there. And it's things like the zigzagging. So, you know, you reward it for not going off the track, and then suddenly it will start doing this because it realizes it gets more reward by for doing it. And you only learn that by making that mistake and trying it. Now, if you publish a perfect reward function, it, it won't do it, obviously, because you, you, you learn that lesson. But will the person playing it, reading it, using it? Do it? Now, I don't know, I've, great, I've, said, I've got no issue with publishing it, and, and there's a certain discussion around doing some retrospectives post races. So where it doesn't make any difference anymore for like the May virtual race, how my reward function works. Because each month I've found I've had to adapt my reward function quite a bit to not to fit the course, but to adapt to the different things Amazon keep introducing. Like there's a bridge last month, you know, which was an interesting discovery about how you can, how you can change some of those sorts of things. So yeah, I, yeah, I guess some people object to, hey, this is a pure competition, like you know, keep all your cards secret, um, like you would with poker versus playing an open hand and, um, and never going to win, like someone else will, 